parts are unit two lecture notes where we're looking at the road to revolution. This unit's broken up into three uh, basic parts, the first of which is that road to revolution, getting to the point where Americans finally revolt against Great Britain. Number two is the revolution itself, and number three is the formation of our modern constitution. All right, so let's get going on the road to revolution and talk about how we get from point A to point B. Um, it's important to remember the Enlightenment era and the impact that it had on America. And we're going to be refer uh, referencing the Enlightenment figures, the big Enlightenment names from time to time, such as John Locke and Montesquieu and Rousseau. Um, but the Enlightenment swept America much like it did Europe. Uh, the Salem witch trials, people began to question witchcraft. Even though that had happened, people were disillusioned with that uh, fanaticism. And people began to develop scientific reasoning uh, based know, on Enlightenment method. Method from Francis Bacon. Uh, who's the second person we looked at with the last name of Bacon. Uh, but he's the person that came up with our modern scientific method about uh, observations, uh, hypotheses, uh, testing, and forming a theory. People began to look beyond the religious doctrine to answer, uh, answer big questions in life. Uh, they started to develop the sense that the world was not governed by miracles, but on these mathematical and physical laws that we um, you know, know such so well today, such as, you know, we don't assume that God keeps us pasted to the earth. We know that the earth has a magnetic field and it attracts larger objects and it has its own gravity due to its mass. All right. These enlightenment ideas are going to travel from Europe to America. Now, oddly enough, for all the fanaticism the Puritans had, one thing that they put an emphasis on was the ability to read. And that is so that people could read the Bible. Um, this is going to sort of backfire when you look at enlightenment thought because this ability to read is going to cause people to look through these books and pamphlets of the Enlightenment era. So the ability to read actually causes the Enlightenment to spur in America. The Great Awakening also has an important integral part of this uh, development towards American Revolution. Um, like we looked at in class, America started to transform into a more of an in individualistic society. And the Great Awakening is going to add a religious background to that individualism. The Great Awakening essentially by itself is a religious revival stressing your relationship with God. Now keep in mind you want to stress your because it is an individual aspect that we're going to be focusing on here. Um, with the Great Awakening, confessing your sins was important again individually, individually having that experience. And this is going to occur in the 1730s and 40s. You're going to have huge gatherings that basically resemble rock concerts. Uh, famous pastors are going to step forward at this time. One such pastor is Jonathan Edwards, who we uh, looked at in class, who wrote the Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, uh, where he talked about the concept that God keeps you from falling into the pit and into hell. But we know also that he is pointing at the individual, and the individual has to make the choice to not go to hell. Again, tying this back into individualism. Um, Edwards himself was a famous preacher. He said that men and women were completely dependent on God, that they had to have God for everything. He wanted to return to an old Puritan view of this devotion to God, but hopefully with less fanaticism. Another famous Great Awakening preacher was George Whitfield. He had tremendous success. He was probably one of the most popular. He was a former actor, which just kind of added to the, uh, to the terrific portrayals that he gave from the pulpit. And he is a major force in the Great Awakening, also a major force in the denomination. One thing that was not on the video, uh, the actors that they had did not portray this at all, but Whitfield was actually We also need to look at the British control and how that's going to impact individualism. King James II revoked the Massachusetts Charter, and when you do that, that makes he makes the area a royal colony. It becomes under his direct control. Now, this could be a problem for many that felt themselves as individuals. They didn't want to be controlled by another force, but the king and Great Britain followed this policy of salutary neglect. Salutary, salutary neglect is basically where you relax your supervision of the colonies, and they allow the colonies the to function on The king only themselves. focused on defense and trade things that made money and protecting the colonists. But the colonies themselves started to govern themselves. Self-government arises in America. These people become important. They control their own destiny, and that is important. Because later when British comes back and tries to reevaluate the situation, try to implement taxation, the Americans are not going to like this. They've gone years of taking care of themselves and governing themselves, so obviously a new British governance is not going to sit well with them. Great Britain's also going to initiate the Navigation Acts, which we looked at in the last unit. This is basically where the British start to control the transport of all goods. Okay, All goods had to be shipped in a British ship. They had to come to a British ship. So you can imagine, because of these acts, you're going to see a rise in smuggling, which uh, some of the 
founding fathers are actually going to be involved in as well. Um, Americans made crops and gave them to Britain. It's the cash crop system. And then America would buy back these British manufactured goods. Now, obviously, Britain has a monopoly because of this on the American colonies. And you can see that doesn't really bode well when you're looking at individualism. We need to take this time to kind of look at Ben Franklin as well. Uh, Franklin is going to come up again and again and again in the notes, so we need to have a foundation of what he is and where he comes from. Now, obviously, he's one of America's founding fathers. I mean, today he's on the $100 bill, so he had to have been important, right? But it's odd because Franklin himself was never a president. Franklin was born to a poor family. He moved to London and then back to Philly in 1726, the city of brotherly love. Franklin himself was very individualistic, and I guess you could argue, argue that at this time, being very individualistic was also being very American. Franklin himself was initially poor, but he rose to become a famous philosopher, scientist, and politician. His social class changed, and this is the concept that we know as social mobility. Um, when you think of the word social, we automatically associate it with class. Uh, and when you think about the word mobility, think about that change in class. So it's essentially a class change. He rose from poor to wealth. All right, now, remember you had empires that were competing for resources in North America. Uh, France, Spain, and England were the largest, but the main two were France and Great Britain. Uh, the French and British have been vying for control of the American lands for a long time, uh, specifically lands west of the Appalachian Mountains. We know this as the Ohio River Valley. And basically it's just the need to expand, the need to push the horizon and go through, um, you know, Providence designed and to move forward and to take new lands and settle it and use the resources just as the system of mercantilism implies. All right, so here is where the competition is. Now Franklin had at one time tried to bring up the idea of the colonies being able to work themselves and deal with their own defense and trade and such things as that because remember right now all of this is British controlled. Uh, Franklin decides to initiate the Albany Plan of Union. So you have an assembly of colonies essentially in the Albany Plan that are going to manage trade, they're going to regulate the Indian relations, and they're going to take care of their own defense. This is basically the colonies taking care of themselves without the British intervening at all. Uh, obviously this did not pass in Parliament. The British were going to maintain control. Um, so you can see Britain's already having trouble with its own col with its own colonists that are already in North America, and they're also vying for control with France. So these uh, French and Anglo type of relations are going to deteriorate over time and eventually culminate in a big war, which we know is today. Now the, the French, French and Indian, Indian War lasts roughly from 1754 to 1763. It is sometimes referred to as the Seven Years' War. However, as you can see, it did not last seven years. It started over Ohio and West Pennsylvania. Um, these areas right in here, basically the, what we know as today is a, a very much part right. of the Appalachian. The war, where it takes its name, the French and Indian War, well obviously the French were the opposition, even to the colonists at the time, because a lot of colonists are going to side with the English, they're sovereign. The Indian aspect comes from the alliance system that was taking place during the French and Indian War. Now you had some natives that allied with the British, yes, but most Indians, most Indians tended to support the French. Now, why do you think that is? Well, they had less permanent settlers, keep in mind. All right, most of the French settlers were up here in New France, and you had some down in the Louisiana areas here. But f in large part, the majority of the settlers were over in the English territories right here. Uh, France had very small numbers of colonists, and they were heavily involved in the fur trade. And keep in mind what you got in return for the fur trade. Indians would get guns, and they would also get Christianity through Catholicism. This is uh, completely different to the British who would uh, basically just initiate the scorched earth policy trying to get more and more land. So obviously the Indians and the French had the best relationship. Now to make a long story short, um, British will wage and the British wage an excellent war uh, at this time and they do it mostly in North America. It ends up, um, but to kind of breeze through some of the highlights, uh, the British took a huge defeat at Fort Duquesne. Now, the reason Fort Duquesne is important is because over in this time, the British commander was killed. George Washington actually gets involved in this. Uh, George Washington, our first president, one of the founding fathers, is going to gain huge full advantage in this war. He's going to gain a lot of experience in this war, and he's going to notice some significant British weaknesses. And that's all I really want you to focus on as far as what goes on here, is George Washington getting experience and seeing 
uh, places where he can exploit the British Army later on. By 1756, the war had spread to Europe, and this is pretty much where it, uh, it gets the name, the Seven Years' War. William Pitt takes over the British operations in America. William Pitt uh, is an Englishman, and he becomes prime minister. He's not really important as far as our, our concentration on the American colonies, but because he becomes prime minister, he changes things. He's a real good war minister, and he switches the favor of the war for the British. The British are going to come back and they're going to take Fort Duquesne. They're going to rename it Fort Pitt after William. Then they're going to move up and take Quebec, and they're going to take Montreal. So essentially the British are taking over Canada. British victories are going to convince the Iroquois Indians. The Iroquois had a massive population around this area here, a huge confederation. And they're going to ally with the British. By 1763, the war is nearing its end. Finally, the conclusion of the war takes place in 1763 with the Treaty of Paris. Now keep in mind, the last battle does not end the war. The treaty ends the war. Brit Britain claimed all lands east of the Mississippi and Florida except for New Orleans, a port way down here which they allowed the French to keep. But look at this changeover. You know, used to, the, the British were right here on the coast. And the French were up in this area here. And they were competing for control of this area. Now this entire red section here is all Great Britain, including Florida. Now, the Indians are automatically going to realize that the British are harder to deal with, um, especially since a lot of the Indians had allied with the French during the war. So this is going to be a problem as time goes on. Some of these native relations are going to deteriorate into just open arms struggles. Uh, one notable one is Chief Pontiac's Rebellion. Pontiac aligned with a lot of other tribes. We, we talked about this before when we looked at uh, the Poetan uh, massacre and King Philip's War. Uh, Pontiac is going to seize numerous British forts. He's going to actually kill about 2,000 Englishmen at this time. Um, it's pretty impressive for an Indian uprising. But his alliance begins to weaken. Um, eventually, this weakening alliance is going to force Pontiac to sign a peace treaty with the British. Um, it's also notable in this uh, in Chief Pontiac's Rebellion that one of the tactics that the British used to defeat the uh, the Indians as they started to gain the upper hand was they used blankets that they had put on smallpox patients and they traded them to the uh, Indians. The Indians, again, they had no immunities to European diseases, so it would just spread through Indian camps like a massive plague. Now, the proclamation of 1763 comes about because England now controls this vast area of land, and it's inhabited by Indians. Now you have a problem here. There's a lot of colonists on the coast, and they want to spread west. They want land, okay, but the English cannot help them. The reason is, is because it's expensive to build forts all on that countryside and to protect the colonists. The proclamation of 1763 is actually initiated because it seems like a great idea to protect the colonists, to keep them from having conflicts with the Indians. But the colonists don't see it this way. Keep in mind they're individualists. They want to spread. They want land. And what do they do? They ignore the right. proclamation. Because they ignore the proclamation, this is where some of the first hostilities are going to occur. Uh, the first um, point to action, such as taxes, the proclamation, salutary neglect. These things you can isolate in on and say that they are some of the causes of the American Revolution. All right. So it's here we're actually going to stop these notes, um, and we're going to open up a new branch of notes for taxes tomorrow. Um, but keep in mind, these are the opening. Uh, these are kind of the opening steps towards the American Revolution. This strong individualism, the deterioration of the Frank and Anglo relationships, and those relationships with the natives. How does that affect the colonists? How do the colonists maintain individualism throughout that? Where does individualism, individualism pop up during this time? Okay, note figures like Ben Franklin, who is a great example of social mobility. And keep in mind that at the end of this Franco, uh, or at the, at the end of this French and Indian War, the English won, they had more land, and they didn't want to give it all to the colonists. And the colonists as individuals were against this.